Assessment Archive. She joined us in April of this year. She's super cool and she's going to blow our minds today. But she has a murder in the uh, So please welcome her with me. Cook 
uh, accused him of seduction and said that he was the father of her illegitimate child who was born, stillborn. Uh, Sharp denied the accusations and his reputation was pretty much unscathed. Um, there were, there are a couple of reasons why. We'll get into that with Anna. So who is Anna, this woman jumping up and randomly accusing this um, state representative of seduction? Anna Cook uh, was the daughter of a well-to-do farmer from, I want to say, uh, West Virginia, something like that. She moved here. Um, but she, uh, her father passed away, uh, and they moved to Kentucky, and uh, that's presumably where she met Sharp and the seduction occurred. Uh, she was described as a free thinker, how dare she, um, <laughs> and was later accused by Dr. Leander Sharp, who was Solomon Sharp's brother, of doing terrible things like reading books, <laughs> picking flowers, and going for walks by herself. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to say, say um, unbiased with historical work. I don't like Leander Sharp. I'm going to put that on the table for you right now. <laughs> um, so that was kind of her reputation after all of the events of the tragedy. Um, and of course, as a woman in the 1820s, since she did, it was well known that she was a dishonored woman. Uh, so she secluded herself basically at her family's farm uh, after everything was sharp, and especially after she accused him openly of seduction, she pretty much went into hiding at her family's farm. So another thing about the rumor of the baby, and this is important for multiple reasons, at the time of uh, her telling everyone about the seduction, a group of people in favor of Solomon, not necessarily Solomon himself, but his friends, started a counter rumor that her baby was actually of mixed race and was the byproduct of her relationship with one of the enslaved peoples on her family's farm. We do not have time to unpack all of that, <laughs> um, but at this point in time, obviously, there's kind of no way of knowing the real truth about that, um, but that was a rumor that was spread, and that did contribute, uh, contribute to her isolation. Um, with more people kind of at the time in, in favor of Solomon um, because everyone really liked Solomon, I suppose, and they were more willing to believe that this woman um, was pushing off her, I suppose, social problems onto him rather than believe um, that maybe he had a hand in it. Uh, and I'll kind of say this now too there's i haven't gone strictly into the evidence of like did solomon really do this did he have a relationship with anna um but you know i think we've all heard plenty of stories about a woman who says hey this guy treated me a certain way and this is a result of how that happened and everyone just kind of going Oh, okay, and not really either believing her or brushing it off to the side. So uh, just kind of to keep that in mind. So that's Anna and Solomon. Now we have Jeroboam, Jeroboam Beecham. Um, he was a young upstart lawyer from Simpson County, Kentucky, um, and he was once acquainted with Solomon Sharp. He denies that he was ever friends with him. <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> but he was acquainted with him for sure. Um, but, interestingly enough, he completely severed ties with Solomon once he heard about um, Solomon dishonoring uh, Anna. Cut ties and immediately believed her. 
Um, and eventually sought an audience with her. Oh. <laughs> Let me take a little sip of water. <laughs> that's, that's like one of the densest slides too. <laughs> Okay, so I know this is a whole thing about murder and such. Uh, get ready for some Jane Austen type romance. Because um, Jeroboam loved Anna. If there is one thing you take away from this whole presentation, Jeroboam loved. Do the kids still say down bad? <laughs> okay. he, he was down bad for Anna. All right, so he hears about Anna and immediately decides he doesn't like Solomon anymore and that Solomon did dishonor Anna and he seeks out an audience with her just because. And one of his friends also said that she was really beautiful. So he was like, all right, let's go see what this is all about. So he finds her and he kind of repeatedly asks like, hey, I want to come and visit you because I've heard a lot of good things about you. One of my friends who is also your friends, you know, kind of like modern times. I know her from a friend of a friend and like I, that kind of thing. Um, and she's kind of like, no, I don't really want to associate with people because I just kind of had a bad time socially and other things. So I don't really want to know new people. Um, but eventually, she relents and she's fine, come over, I guess. Um, and he, uh, Jeroboam asks specifically if he can use her library. That's kind of sweet because they bonded over their favorite philosophy, uh, philosophy books. Uh, but even with this kind of fragile friendship in the making, Anna was keeping him at an arm's length. Obviously, she was socially a dishonored woman. Uh, and I'm sure at the time she probably felt that um, associating with quote unquote an untarnished person, she didn't want to spread her social troubles to other people. Um, but eventually, infection did bloom between the two. Um, and Jeroboam, he proposes to her, and he's like, please, I love you very much. Oh, a, kind of an important thing to note, too, Anna was um, significantly older than Jeroboam. Jeroboam was like 20, early 20s, um, and she was in her mid-30s. So, so there, was, there was a gap. There was a gap. Um, so you could say that Jeroboam was a young man in love. Uh, he definitely was. Uh, he eventually wrote a whole pamphlet <coughs> called Confession of Jeroboam O. Beecham, and literally 40% of it is him talking about how much he loves his wife. So, yeah, and it's like 130 pages, so, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, he proposes, and at first she refuses because, as I said, uh, she's not, uh, she thinks that she's not good enough uh, for him due to her status as a dishonored woman. But, she says, if someone, you know, killed Solomon Sharp, I would marry him. I'd be down for that. <laughs> and here is a direct quote from Jeroboam about how that statement made him feel. No conditions nor any earthly proposition she could have made me could have filled me with so much delight. <laughs> Whenever I had contemplated a marriage with her, I had always esteemed the death of, Col of Colonel Sharp a necessary consequence. I never for a moment could feel that I could suffer a villain to live who had been the seducer of one I pressed to my bosom as a wife. And to hear her thus require what I had so much calculated on and desired was peculiarly pleasing to me indeed. <laughs> These feelings I expressed to her and told her it had been my firm purpose to take Colonel Sharp's life if I married her. She then consented to be my wife, and in my ardor I determined to fight Car uh, Colonel Sharp before our marriage. Yeah. <laughs> And there's more stuff like that throughout the entire confession. It's actually kind of funny because he's confessing to, spoiler alert, a murderer, um, but also saying, but I love my wife. It's like if someone came home and was like, yeah, 
I just ran someone off the road. Don't know how they are, but man, I love my partner like so much. It he down bad. You cannot, you cannot trust it enough. Uh, so they were married around 1824. And so the plotting begins. He said that he was going to fight her, uh, fight Sharp before marriage. I think his timeline is a little bit out of whack, but you know, it's whatever. He he meant it. He would. He'd do it. <laughs> All right. So the plots, plural. There's a reason for that plural. I'll tell you that. Um, so uh, the Beechams think of a few different ways to get rid of Sharp. Uh, Jeroboam proposes a proper duel in Frankfurt, but this does not work out. Uh, this is essentially what happens. Uh, Jeroboam goes on to Frankfurt, which of course is where Sharp was living since he was a big political person at the time. Uh, and he, greet, he greets Sharp as a friend. He's like, hey man, how's it going? Haven't seen you in a bit. And, and Sharp's like, hey! What's, it, what's been up, man? How are you doing? And Jeroboam's like, let's go take a walk. We have something to talk about, you know? Let's take a, let's take a walk. And they go down to a secluded uh, part of secluded area next to a river. Uh, and Sharp says, what's up? What's going on? And Jeroboam says, hey, I've been come sent by Anna Cook to avenge her, arm, her honor. And as he describes in confession, Sharp turns white as a ghost and is like, oh, what do you mean? Uh, and uh, Jeroboam uh, is like, duel me right here, right now. Sharp says, I don't have a weapon. Jeroboam pulls out two knives and throws one to him and says, now you do. <laughs> so, but Sharp... Uh, he gets out of the duel claiming that he can never fight the friend of that worthy injured lady and even goes so far to say, if her brothers had murdered me, I never could have had the heart to raise my hand to defend myself. This is from Jeroboam's confession, so you can take it with a grain of salt as to whether or not he actually said that. Jeroboam, he writes colorfully, and I'll, I'll leave it at that for right now. Um, allegedly, Jeroboam roughs him up uh, and also tells Sharp that if they don't duel soon, they'll go around publicly whipping Sharp every single day until they do. Like, he will just walk around town bull whipping him, saying, fight me now. Um, so he, <laughs> Jeroboam, probably foolishly, gives uh, Sharp the next, until the next day uh, to arm himself, uh, and then Sharp just leaves. He goes to Bowling Green. He gets out of town. He's like, no, I'm not dealing with this right now. I'm running for state rep. <laughs> I don't have time to duel this person. Uh, well, and also, interestingly enough, I learned this within the last like couple weeks. Sharp also had recently passed a bill um, where uh, that, I, if I'm remembering correctly, it disqualified politicians who had been in duels um, from running. And interestingly enough, so jumping forward a lot in time, my dad um, was a police officer, a state trooper. Even then, in the 70s, he had to sign a contract that said that he, ha he didn't duel anyone. So this is a long-standing part of Kentucky's law. Don't duel people um, if you're planning on running for political or state office, I suppose. Um, so yeah, so that trip to Frankfurt didn't work. Uh, meanwhile, Anna uh, has Jeroboam teach her uh, how to shoot a gun, which bonding, I suppose, fun couples activity. Um, Jeroboam notes in his confession that he did not like this because he wanted to be the one who, who did sharpen. So chivalry is not done, I suppose. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so other time time passes, and eventually Jeroboam's like, I'm going to try Frankfurt one more time. I know he's there. Um, so on the eve of Sharp's transfer from uh, the uh, transfer from attorney general to uh, state representative, um, Jeroboam arrives in Frankfurt. 
He has a disguise. He's ready. Um, and it's like a black mask that he said Anna had perfectly molded to his face. And, you know, I don't know. Uh, he, I think she, if, even if she had made something terrible, he would have said, oh, she made this perfect disguise for me. I love my wife. <laughs> uh, but it has a black uh, mask that Anna molded to his face and a bandana to keep it in place. This is important to note because Jeroboam noted that he rigged it up this way so that he could dramatically pull the mask up so that Sharp could see who was about to kill him, but then also swiftly pull it back down so that he could run away from the murder scene. <laughs> yes, he specifically did it for that purpose. Um, so, uh, also he wore several layers of socks but no shoes so that if he walked through the mud, uh, no one could track him by the shoe prints. He's an innovative guy, this Jeroboam. <laughs> He's got ideas, he's got thoughts, he's got plans. <laughs> uh, so, now we come to the fateful night of November 7, 1825. So on that night, uh, it's deep at night, it's like, it's past bedtime for sure. Um, and Jeroboam, he's in his costume, he's in his disguise, he finds Sharp's house, and knocks on the door, uh, and Sharp, uh, roused by the knocking, uh, but not really ready to open the door for someone he doesn't know in the middle of the night, he says, who's out there? And Jeroboam says that he's John Covington, which Sharp did know a John Covington, so he was like, oh, weird for him to drop by, but, uh, and he opens the door, which obviously proved to be a fatal mistake. Jeroboam, quick as lightning, grabs Sharp and forces them both inside the house. Solomon demands, who are you? You're not who I thought you were. You're not John Covington. And Jeroboam, kind of loosening his grip enough, he goes into detail about this in the confession, loosens his grip just enough so that Solomon can kind of like angle himself better to see his attacker. Uh, Jeroboam says, come closer and you'll know me well, as he pulls <laughs> up the mask. And Solomon, his final words, according to Jeroboam, is, good God, it's him. <laughs> <laughs> Which, not the worst thing you can say before you die, but as we've proven, it's kind of ironically funny. <laughs> Uh, Jeroboam's final words to Solomon is, die, you villain. And then he plunges his dagger straight into Solomon's heart and kills him instantly. Mrs. Sharp saw all of this. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> it's almost too, like, you know, too good to be true, right? So, um, but yeah, uh, Jeroboam even mentions in his confession that he had seen movement on, the, uh, I think, the staircase or maybe in the other room. And that was Mrs. Sharp, who was like, oh, I wonder who my husband's talking to! <laughs> like, oh no! Um, so, uh, she is a witness to all of this, but stays hidden. Jeroboam does not stick around to tie up loose ends. You know, that's good. Mrs. Sharp didn't do anything. I don't think that warrants a stab to the heart. Um, she stays hidden, um, and he, uh, Jeroboam quickly pulls back down his disguise and runs out, uh, and yeah, so he, he thinks that he got away with it, and like I said before, he had his <laughs> multiple socks on, sorry. <laughs> that part, that part always gets me, because it's like, I totally understand where he's coming from, but it's also ridiculous to think of a man wearing like five or six pairs of socks <laughs> to a murderer. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know. Um, I, and Solomon is like, I just got killed by a guy with no shoes on. So, um, so uh, Jeroboam leaves, and uh, at the time uh, of the murder, he was staying at a tavern, because obviously this is the 1820s, it wasn't like an easy drive to go from uh, I think Anna was in 
Warren County at the time to Frankfurt, like that's a bit of a stretch. So he's staying at a tavern. Literally the next morning, everyone's like, Solomon Sharp got stabbed to death in his house. And he's like, wow, really? Who could have done that? And everyone's like, yeah, who could have done that, Jeroboam? <laughs> who could have done that? There were other people who publicly threatened to kill Solomon Sharp. <laughs> I told you he was, he had enemies. Um, the two other people, predominant people, who were thought to have killed Sharp at this time uh, was a guy named Patrick Henry Darby, uh, who was another attorney and also a political opponent, and who also said, hey, Solomon, I'll kill you. And everyone was like, okay. <laughs> uh, and then there was another guy. I don't know much about him, but he, he, he is a fascinating mystery, because I want to know who hurt him so much to be this angry. John E. Warren, also a political p opponent of Solomon, also threatened his life at one point and specifically said something about stabbing him to death. But he could not have committed the murder because the day before the murder, Warren had been shot twice. He lived and then went on to shoot someone to death in the 1830s. So John E. Warren, not a pleasant person, I suppose. Um, so. Solomon is murdered, Jeroboam is going back to Anna, like, cats in the bag, we got it. Um, meanwhile, there is a giant manhunt for the killer, um, and tons of money was put up, not just by Solomon's friends, but also the governor of Kentucky at the time, uh, Joseph Dacia. Uh, at the time, the uh, bounty was $5,000, which adjusted for today is like $195,000. Yeah, thank you inflation calculator. <laughs> so like that kind of tells you the importance um, that Solomon had amongst his friends and even with the governor himself. Although I suppose if you were governor, you wouldn't want to have your newly fresh state rep get killed and then kind of not do anything about it. I, I get it, so I don't know, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Jeroboam, he makes it back to Anna, tells her, hey babe, that thing you want to take it care of, I get it, uh, and as he writes in the confession, she falls to her knees and thanks him and God, uh, and they're very happy for like a five second period before people come to arrest Jeroboam, because <laughs> <laughs> he, he was not a very good uh, poker face, I don't think. Um, I'm not entirely sure what his date of apprehension is. While I was researching this, I was using the Kentucky Gazette newspaper a lot, um, and there's actually quite a stretch of time between the murder and Jeroboam's arrest. There's like four or five months. The way Jeroboam describes it, a posse came to wrangle him up um, kind of immediately, so maybe he was just in jail for a long period of time. That part's a little bit fuzzy for me, but he was arrested. So, almost immediately, a trial commences in Frankfurt. Uh, and while this happens, Jeroboam writes a whole confession, um, basically saying, I did it, and I'd do it again. <laughs> um, which, if you're a police officer or any member of the law, I guess that's the greatest confession you could ever get, is just like, yeah, I did it, and I would do it any amount of times necessary. Um, and it's also interesting, uh, the confession document is an interesting one because he doesn't start with the murder. He starts with him meeting Anna, which is kind of sweet. <laughs> like, you don't want to romanticize murder. We don't have to. Anna and Jeroboam already did. So, yeah. But he, he starts with how he met Anna and how they fell in love and how, you know, he grew to know this woman and care for her deeply. Yeah, and then he gets to the murder. So, yeah, he his priorities um, in the confession are, are interesting. Um, and it's also an interesting thing to note the way that I interpreted his confession, and again, this is my own interpretation, he wrote it because he was upset 
um, with how many things wrong other people were getting in the trial. <laughs> so someone would say, oh, this happened. And he would be like, nah, -uh. no, it happened this way. <laughs> and yeah, so he, he had priorities. I don't know how else to describe them. Um, but he is arrested, the trial commences, it is maybe the fastest trial in all the world because they were like, well, he's guilty, he literally said so himself, um, and he is sentenced to hang. Um, Anna visits him in jail, uh, and they both try to commit suicide three times, twice by laudanum and once by stabbing. The laudanum does not work either time, they just get really sick. Um, I know, I know. Uh, they just get very sick, um, but the third time with the stabbing, it proves fatal for Anna. Jeroboam's not in good shape, but he's not like immediately dead. Um, Anna is taken away, uh, and it's the day of Jeroboam's hanging, and obviously he wants to see his wife that he loves so much one last time before he dies, is, is, um, you know, is executed. Um, so he's arguing with the guards, let me see my wife, and they say, no, she's fine, she's recovering. I don't know why they lied to them. Um, I think they kind of underestimated how dedicated Jeroboam was to Anna, because he fought and was like, I'm not going anywhere until I see my wife. They finally take her to, um, I assume, the uh, prison hospital area, and she is dying. She's, she's bleeding out, and he holds her hand until she passes away. I know. <laughs> and his final words to her is, I lived for you, now I die for you. As I said, it's not good to romanticize murder or murderers. <laughs> We don't have to because they already did. <laughs> they did the work for us. <laughs> and, and so he is taken off, bleeding from the stab wound. He is basically dead by the time they get him up to the gallows. They hang him anyway. And his final day on earth was July 7th of 1826. And he was only 23 years old. So again, he was a young, he was a young man. And this all kind of happened over the span of like two or three years. So he lived fast and died hard. <laughs> that's, that's the name of a movie, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, so even though they both are dead, uh, they did have stipulations of what they wanted to happen to their bodies. And they were buried together with um, her head on his arm kind of like in time, they're both in the same coffin, uh, and uh, with their arms around each other, they were interred into the earth. Um, and the headstone has an excerpt uh, from a poem that Anna wrote about how much she loved Jeroboam. So, yeah. And you can visit this grave, um, God, I can't remember where it is. Ah! I wrote it down. Good. It's in Nelson County in Bloomfield. I haven't been to see it myself, but gosh, I want to because the pictures on Find a Grave are not that good. Um, I would love to update the pictures to something where you can read the poem. Uh, it's a little hard to do that with what's on there. But that is the story of Anna and Jeroboam.
arrested for her hand in this, but for some reason, even though she obviously told Jeroboam, hey, do this, and Jeroboam says, yeah, she asked me to, she wasn't tried for it. Uh, they kind of let her go, and I can't really determine if that's because it was the 1820s and they were like, well, she's a woman. She can't kill people, right? Or Too or, busy picking flowers. Too busy picking flowers, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, if memory serves, I think Jeroboam says, or no, wait, he couldn't have because he was dead. Sorry. <laughs> I'm mixing up my, my historical uh, stuff. I think it's said that she kept, like, had it hidden in her bodice. Or she could have had it in her pocket. It's the 1820s, so they might have still had pockets with the dresses. Okay, yeah. Separate. Yeah, and I don't think um, a gentleman of the time, even a prison guard, would have frisked uh, Not even after the like, second or third. <laughs> I, think, I, I think they might have tried it like during the night when everyone was asleep. Yeah, they didn't do this like in the week, like the, the hour before the execution. I think it's I think it's from what I understand, they tried it like during the night, they both got sick from the laudanum, and then they were like, well, there's always plan B and sad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, yeah, I'm not sure of the logistics, but they, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, uh, any other questions before I move on to the more academic stuff, I suppose? Okay, um, so, uh, this is where I sneakily jab you with the academic stuff and, and research methods and such. Um, so this research, I, for me, I consider it pretty ongoing. Um, one of the most frustrating, but also, I guess, kind of wonderful things about historical research is that there will always be pieces missing. And there will always be those questions that you can't answer, and you really want to, and you'll have your eyes open for them for the rest of your life, but they may never pop up. Um, People always ask, like, what would you, if you could meet a historical figure, who would you want to meet? And it's like, there's too many, because I have many questions for a lot of different people. <laughs> um, but this whole story is really just kind of one condensed angle of a very dense part of Kentucky history. Uh, there is tons more information. I could go more into the political stuff. Uh, and look more into that, um, but old court, new court controversy is not very, uh, it's important, but I, I don't care about it as much, obviously. There's kind of more important things going on. <laughs> um, but there are multiple POVs, slanders and rumors, uh, newspaper articles, how the politics of the time of, uh, affected the search for the murderer and the trial, like, there's a jumble. This is a Gordian knot of information that, you know, one day will it be untangled? I do not know. Um, a big question for me, as much as we've come to know and love Jeroboam, uh, there is, you know, coming into question the validity of his confession. He's very hyperbolic, and you can't help but wonder, like, where does the hyperbole begin? Where does truth begin? Are these two things interchangeable? Is Jeroboam just, you know, really talking himself up? Because he does uh, in that confession. Um, and then going back to Leander Sharp, Leander Sharp, um, he wrote a whole book two or three years after all of this was finished. So Jeroboam and Anna are dead and buried. Leander came out with a whole novel um, called The Vindication of Colonel Solomon Sharp, where he basically says that Anna was a prostitute, that Jeroboam um, impregnated several women before marriage, um, and that Solomon was the greatest person who ever lived and was snatched from this earth far too soon. Um, and again, where does fact end and where does hyperbole begin? Sadly, a really big piece of this puzzle that I don't know will ever be uncovered is Anna's perspective on the story. At the start of confession, uh, Jeroboam makes a note that Anna has uh, signed off on his confession and said, yep, I agree with everything in here. 
which is cool and good. But what was her, what were her thoughts? What were her feelings? What's this in, uh, whole entire affair in her words? There was a tale, or there was a book that had circulated, again, a couple of years after all of this ended, that supposedly had her letters in it, but this has been highly contested, and I think that book has been lost to time. I have not been able to find it anywhere. Um, and kind of branching off of that, this entire, uh, entire tragedy is centered on a woman. So now we go more into, how would you describe it, the like meta thinking and the meta academic, I'm making up words and phrases, um, a portion of research where you think of it from a modern perspective. This is a tragedy that's focused on a woman. Uh, who was she? Was her story true? What, uh, what was her perspective on these events? Can we trust Jeroboam as being the stand in um, to tell her story? Uh, is it right to rely on a man's word uh, to tell us how the woman in a situation felt, uh, even if they were closely tied to one another? Uh, these are questions that haunt me at night. <laughs> I'm not, it's, I give them to you uh, not to say that I have an answer because I think the answer is big and long and complicated um, and also could be, you know, up to interpretation for some things. Um, but uh, just food for thought. Okay, so where did I get all of my information? Uh, digital archives. Digital archives are amazing. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find a lot of information on this tragedy here in our archives, but there were still things in this archives that I used for different parts of, um, of the research. Like for brief period of time I looked into dueling uh, and we actually have an old newspaper where um, the wife of some politician uh, talks about his almost duel with uh, President Abraham Lincoln. So yeah, and I do have it scanned and ready to email to people if you want to see it. Um, so because uh, dueling is a very interesting part of the law. I think it's really funny that we that we have a law dedicated to not dueling people. But you know, there was a time when people were just like, hey, you wanna know the best way to settle a dispute? Take it out back and see who wins. Um, so all of my information was found using online archives. Uh, and these, this is just a list uh, to name a few. Um, I used a lot of uh, information from the Kentucky Gazette, which was a, a newspaper from the time. I was able to find an online copy of Jeroboam's Confession uh, from Cornell University, I think it was. Um, University of Kentucky has an online version of Vindication, uh, which was also really helpful and enlightening, because um, now I don't like Leander or Sharp. But, uh, so online archives are always a work in progress kind of like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're gonna get. But the great thing is, is that you can always ask an archivist and say, hey, I'm researching this, can you help me? And do you, if you don't have it, do you know someone who does? Um, and uh, kind of a note on this as well, always keep an eye out for information that cannot be verified uh, or that might be, you know, not entirely factually correct. I find it interesting, not to rag on Find a Grave, I love Find a Grave. I'm gonna put my disclaimer here. Find a Grave is a fantastic resource, especially for uh, people interested in genealogy. But on Find a Grave, um, the entry for Anna leans heavily into the um, stuff that Leander wrote about her. It even says that like, I might be paraphrasing, but the entry for Anna on Find a Grave notes that no one talked about her beauty, not even her husband. It's like, well, that's not true. <laughs> her husband loved, like, and that brings up the question of, like, well, does a husband have to tell, uh, or does a partner have to tell their partner every single day, you're beautiful, for them to be beautiful, you know? 
or is Leander Sharp just being really mean to a dead person? I don't know. Um, so always keep an eye out for that kind of uh, difference in information. It doesn't always necessarily mean that it's not true, but it's always, when you see those discrepancies, it's cause to look into it. So uh, to close out things, um, and I guess the whole point behind this uh, presentation, we all love a good story, especially true crime. Um, there is always so much more to discover. Not just true crime, I know everyone loves that the most, but you know, there are other really cool stories to find in digital archives, in physical archives. Um, even if you just look at kind of the average Joe um, living at a certain time, that can be really enlightening and kind of remind you like, these were real people who lived in a real time and had their own issues, and maybe some of those issues line up to what we're feeling today. Um, and that kind of, not to get all preachy, that kind of makes me feel closer to humanity, you know, to look back on something and go, oh, hey, this was still an issue back then? That's disheartening. But hey, at least if I went back in time and said, hey, things are the same, they would be like, ah, we get it, <laughs> you know? Or even like a, when you look at old recipes and think, oh, my mother or my grandmother or my family, we still make and enjoy that every year. Um, there's, there's a real humanizing aspect in doing this kind of research. Um, so my final words to you, after telling you about the roller coaster of a lifetime of Jeroboam, Anna, and Solomon Sharp, uh, is I hope that you are curious and stay open to the possibilities and get or stay excited.